Right, let's move on to a topic that's very close to my heart. I'm David Lloyd. I'm privileged to be the host of uh, TechCon. I think I've been doing this for uh, about the last 10 years, but rarely do I get a chance to, to talk about anything. But this is something that's very close to my heart, and this is a new radio station we've created, and the radio station is called Boom Radio, and it launched in uh, February of this year. And let me share with you some of the thinking uh, behind Boom Radio, if we can just... There we are. Boom Radio. We've got a logo. What more can you wish for? Boom Radio. This was a, a thought I had that people of a certain age didn't really have a radio station to go to anymore. Radio 2 and BBC Local Radio were moving, and we see all the reasons behind that. But really, for people in their 60s or 70s, which radio station, which full-service radio station is there to listen to? So we, we had this idea for a radio station for baby boomers. Feel young again, take you back in time, but not a radio station set in the past, a radio station for today with all the rich offering of a, a general linear full service radio station. And the original intention was to transmit this station on old style DAB in London, a few of the small scale DAB multiplexes around the country and online, of course, just to test it for a year to see how it went down. And so we launched like that on uh, February the 14th. Within days of that launch, I have never known the passion of response. It was really as if we'd invented radio again for a generation. Literally thousands of emails, really gushing emails. And one of the nicer comments we had the other day was, you've made me fall in love with radio again. So we realized we had to respond, respond. and therefore we put out the radio station nationally uh, on SDL in DAB Plus in addition. That wasn't an expense, it was a significant expense that we were uh, we were expecting. So it's going very well and now we publish Radio and I think a lot of people's bystanders say, you know, it's been a pretty impressive commercial radio station launch. But there have been a load of challenges. Now the challenge are we needed to do it uh, efficiently and economically. There's not a lot of money in the demographic that we're broadcasting to. Of course, it is a, a demographic with significant wealth, we're told. I don't have much of it, but, it, but we're told it has. But actually, advertisers making a, a business out of this audience is not the easiest thing. So we needed to do it efficiently and economically. And we also wanted to bring quite a few names from the past back to our radio station. And those people didn't really want to go to work every day, but they were quite happy to do it from their homes. Many of them were aged in their 70s and 80s. They not uh, Some of them hadn't ever driven a desk before. So this is the challenge. We've got a national radio station with all the richness around that, the news, the interviews, the chat, the weather, the sport, the financial news, the links, the ads, chart shows from 16 places around the world trying to create a radio station of comparable quality to Radio 2. How do we do it? We turn to Quentin Howard. Well, I mean, the idea of um, uh, of getting to a boom radio was just felt absolutely right to me. You know, it was business led, which was important. Uh, Phil Riley doesn't do anything without a spreadsheet. Um, and also it had some really great programming ideas. And it just struck a chord. Um, it, it was everything I felt about music radio uh, to an unserved audience. So Phil's first question to me was, do we have to have premises? Well, I was pretty sure we didn't because I've been broadcasting from home. This is my home studio for uh, a long time. Uh, and um, we also needed somewhere to host the kit. Yes, we would need somewhere, but we could use collaborative tools to keep everybody linked together. It was a sort of challenge, you know, that, uh, that engineers like me absolutely love. But to be frank, it's been a long, long time since I've built a radio station. And so it was a great opportunity for me to get hands on with equipment and assess it all quite objectively because I haven't done it for a long time. So let's dig into the play out and the hardware and then we'll look at the home studios, and the acoustics challenges that presented. Uh, we'll walk you through the digital um, distribution and the transmission and uh, the stats and the analytics. And the analytics are important because. Uh, I'm I'm a, a former program controller as well, and you program a radio station based on what your audience uh, want to do. And as a shareholder in Boom, which I am now, I want the revenue decisions to be based on fact. So it may be a station, you know, as we say on our promos, that's made by a few old mates with a dream, but it's all built on solid data. Are we doing anything unusual at Boom? Probably not. Um, we just set ourselves the extra challenge of doing it during a pandemic. Uh, it definitely forced us to innovate uh, in a way that we might not have done otherwise. 
and I'm sure many other broadcasters during a pandemic experience the same. So, so first of all, let's have a look at our choice of hardware and playout system. Well, it had to be completely self-op, had to be easy to learn. Many of these presenters uh, that we were going to employ hadn't done either VTing before or hadn't done self-op, and some of them actually weren't that good at using computers. Uh, there was also a variety of home setups. I really didn't know what we were going to find in people's homes. Uh, but it quickly became clear when we looked at the technology that the pandemic had seen a few vendors scrabbling to finish off their own remote VT features, which I have to say was a surprise to me. I started broadcasting from here in 1993 as a home broadcaster, and some of the challenges I faced then were still apparent now. I thought it would all be perfect. I was surprised. Um, so David and I spent quite a time looking at online demos, uh, uh, doing a tour of all of the different playout systems, and we ended up with a short list of two, which we then tried out for ourselves. David wanted something that was presenter friendly, it had to segue beautifully, and it also had to allow Paul Roby uh, to build Boom's clocks uh, with exactly the, the music and the format that they wanted. I wanted to see how easily I could break it. I'm quite good at breaking software. So I wanted to do to it what a DJ might do by accident and hit all the wrong buttons and see if I could crash it. So those were pretty important considerations as well as making sure that it, it sounded great. Uh, the other two considerations were ad trafficking and uh, music scheduling. Well, Paul was already familiar with G Selector. And here was, the, here was the interesting point, RCS in the UK and I think this is pretty unique. They offer a complete managed ad scheduling service. We didn't have to employ a traffic manager and an ad scheduler. Uh, RCS would do that for us uh, with their acquire a traffic system. So when we bundle all that together with Zeta to go, we've got RCS. They can host and support all the uh, all the necessary hardware and software, and they can run all our ad scheduling for us, and they do it for a monthly fee. I mean, it was just um, a, a dream for the kind of radio station we were trying to to launch. I've got to say, at RCS, the technical support's been fantastic. Alex is a great guy at RCS. Uh, he's been brilliant. What he doesn't know about radio, you could stick in a thimble. So um, we had our radio station ready to go, all VTing, all using uh, Zeta to go. All we needed was some presenters with a PC and a mic mm -hmm. and all working from home. So I said that it was an opportunity to test lots of kit. Well, I, I thought we might need four levels of kit uh, from a simple USB mic with a pair of cans through to um, an XLR interface and maybe a mini mixer like that Behringer in the middle or maybe a roadcaster, as you can see there and, and behind me. I thought, you know, depending what the presenter wanted to do, we might need to kit them out uh, separately. But my main concern was actually achieving the right level of acoustics and we didn't know what we were going to get in each presenter's home. Um, so a lot of Zoom calls, photographs of their rooms in their house and a little bit of direction. And we were able to find places in everybody's house uh, that um, that sounded quite, uh, quite reasonable, including um, uh, Roger Day, who lives in Spain and lives in a villa, which is all marble and ceramic. Um, we managed that as well. Um, but in terms of the microphones and the kit, I was a bit out of touch. Uh, so I posted a, a post on a Facebook group and just said, hey, guys, what do you use these days? And that came back with a short list, which was terrific for me, because I then went out and bought a dozen different microphones, USB XLR interfaces, a uh, couple of small mixers. And then I sat down and tried them all out. And to get the acoustics right, I just employed a very empirical, empirical approach. I had a script. I had some microphones and I recorded the same script with each microphone in five different rooms in my own house, in the conservatory, in the kitchen, in the lounge, in the dining room and in a bedroom, just to simulate what I might get in all these presenters homes. And that resulted in a short list of two microphones, really. It was the Rode NT-USB, which you can see on the top right and in the bottom left, the good old Yeti, the blue Yeti. Those two stuck out uh, above and beyond uh, other microphones, which was interesting because things like the Audio-Technica 2020 USB had good reviews. In my tests, not so good for rejecting all those echoes. I didn't use, in the end, uh, USB XR interfaces, and the reason I didn't use them was because most of them uh, had problems in the way we wanted to use them. 
typically what they don't tell you in the manual is that the monitoring of USB and live mic in many USB interfaces is only either or, you can't do a mix, whereas on the USB mics you can. And so a lot of them get kicked out of the door just because they wouldn't do the job. Um, there were other problems with them, like insufficient headphone oomph and, and so on. And bear in mind the age of some of our presenters, I needed some headphone oomph. Um, testing all of that paid dividends. I think I, I learned a lot, but also it allowed me to deploy stuff uh, to anybody with a high degree of confidence that it would sound OK. A good example of that was uh, Esther Ranson. Uh, she lives in the New Forest. I couldn't go and see her. I sent her a microphone and a pair of headphones and some pictures of how to set it up. And she set it up within 15 minutes. And she's now on every week uh, on Boom Radio with her daughter doing a two way program, both from their homes. Brilliant. So it was all about the right mic for the job. Nothing changes there. Positioning it correctly and giving people, for example, a decent boom arm just to make sure that the mic positioning was spot on. Very few acoustic adjustments were necessary. A little bit of foam here and there. But frankly, we just took it uh, for what it was. The most important thing was making sure the presenters found it easy to use on their PCs. So I built PC backgrounds and uh, scripted Chrome browsers so that there was a one-click launch for everything they needed. They could go straight to their emails, straight to Zeta, and straight to our whiteboard, which is a shared Google document at the studio whiteboard, just from one click. It had to be as simple as that. Mm. Um, the, we then had uh, the issue, and you've got to bear in mind, this was during the pandemic. It was Christmas last year. So it's easy to think it's, it's, uh, it's easy now, but it wasn't. This was the height of the second wave of the pandemic. Nobody had had any vaccines at this point. Everything was in full lockdown and we were trying to get equipment set up at presenters' homes. So my guiding principle became that we had to be able to talk people through this on the phone uh, and, with, and do lots of how-to pictures. And that required quite a lot of patience. Um, but we did have to do some visits. Uh, and for those, we did a full risk assessment. And uh, Peter, one of our engineers, even bought a full hazmat suit so that he could turn up at one of the presenters' houses, who was worried not unreasonably, uh, and, uh, and, and install their equipment. Uh, can you imagine somebody walking up the path in a full hazmat suit? It's like something out of Doctor Who. Um, it's easy to be comical now about it, but pre-vaccines, these were serious uh, and important concerns. We had a duty of care to our presenters uh, and, of course, to ourselves. Uh, Les Ross, who you can see there on his locomotive, I did his visit personally last year. I've known Les for 46 years, um, and uh, I was there for eight hours. He opened every single window in the house. The reason I was there for eight hours is Les loves to talk. And when he discovered that his locomotive, his class 86 uh, electric locomotive was built by my dad when he ran English Electric, you can imagine what the conversation was like. Engineers and trains always go together. Um, but out of all of this, I did two, I learned two quite important things uh, about uh, our relationship with the presenters. The first, it was really valuable to watch presenters interacting with the equipment. Um, they'd been presenters by and large who'd been used to studio desks. Some of them had never driven anything at all, but they weren't used to doing this on a computer. So solo flying with VT was, was really quite instructive. And I find still today, I spend probably 50% of my time coaching presenters almost as a program controller and giving them sort of little tips rather than just being an engineer. The other 50% is, is fixing problems. Um, the second thing that I discovered was something I discovered from here, which was broadcasting from home creates a very different kind of link with the audience. There's something very intensely personal. It's from my home to your home. And I hear that in buckets and spades now from our boom presenters and the response from our audience. And I'm sure that's got something to do with it all. Lovely, fulfilling. Uh, and if the presenters are a bit apprehensive, then we just help to nudge them on. I think this is the really human thing about uh, Boom Radio is that um, we've given a lot of people, listeners and presenters, a whole new lease of life and a purpose. You know, it's something that's it's mm. it's truly magical. I got to say. Anyway, let's get back to the tech. Um, so I'll take you through our system diagram. Uh, we've got on the on the left here our remote presenters that are all doing VTs over their home broadband. In Les Ross's case, his home broadband isn't good enough, so we do that over 4G. In Judy Spire's case, 
Home broadband was rubbish, no 4G at all in the depths of Devon. But luckily, we found a local WiMAX uh, present, uh, uh, a company who could do um, uh, a local wireless link. Brilliant. That works for her. And if all else fails, there's always Starlink. And then uh, David and Paul and myself and our other engineers remote into RCS uh, to manage all the equipment and the logs and, and upload stuff. Um, let's look at uh, the uh, RCS side of things a little bit more closely. Um, there's a typical RCS network, which I've never seen, I've never played with, I've never plugged into, but it's a network that supports Zeta, the G Selector and the Acquirer and the remote access PCs. And then the two playouts uh, are duplicated. They run in tandem in sync. The auto sequencer one uh, is the main playout, auto sequencer two is the backup. They both have stereo tool as our audio processor on. They have some line cards and then there's Samcast, which does the uh, IceCast encoding. Now, uh, the stereo tool uh, processor is not set particularly aggressively. Uh, and that's because if we were to squeeze it too hard, the limitations of home acoustics would show through and it would sound not so good. But actually, we get a lot of compliments about our sound. So, um, uh, so we must be doing something right. IRN comes in, we take IRN live on the hour, that comes in through a line card uh, and there's a line output as well. If you look at the bottom of the screen, there's a red box, that's the Sonifex silence detector, which feeds our SDL network. That's encoded on site, there's an archiva point of presence at RCS uh, and we can generate the um, SDL uh, um, DAB plus at 24 kilohertz directly on site. Yes, it's only 24 kilohertz. One of the things we did was make it mono. Uh, and the reason we do it as mono is because we're using less bits and it sounds a bit better. And I've got to give a hat tip to Fun Kids and Nick Piggott for that uh, piece of advice. The other thing I did was not sample at 48 kilohertz. I sample at 32 kilohertz. Again, why waste bits on stuff that particularly our audience can't hear? I cut everything off with stereo tool at 16 kilohertz uh, anyway. So that's uh, that's essentially what we have at um, RCS. You can see there's two red lines coming out of the Samcast encoders. They go off to uh, Sharpstream, our uh, streaming distributor. And we've got um, duplicated systems there, but we also have a third fallback. So the top yellow box is the primary ingest from Sharpstream. The, sec the pink box is the secondary ingest. Uh, it's, it's coming into Sharpstream at three, 320 kilobits per second AAC, by the way. The third um, turquoise box there is uh, what we call emergency tape fallback. If the connection to RCS fails for any reason, silence or loss of connection, then at least some audio gets played out by Sharpstream. We then do two sets of encoding and we create six different bit rates out of that. Uh, there's a 320 kilobit MP3, which is used to feed our DAB transmitter in London and our DAB transmitter in Bristol. And then the other bit rates are the consumer bit rates, 192K AAC all the way down to 48K AAC. And there's a 128 MP3 in there as well for compatibility. Those go through an edge server, which you can see roughly in the middle, and they have ads with uh, ad insertion uh, at the end point on the edge servers they will personalize the ads for all the on, uh, online listeners in whatever device they're listening. Um, AdsWiz is interesting. Um, I would have thought 30 years after commercial radio had uh, mastered how to do split ads, the AdsWiz would be much tighter and better. But um, but there we are. It, it is what it is. I'm, I'm, I'm sure uh, everybody has similar problems. Um, the lessons we learned out of uh, this, the lessons I learned certainly, were testing, testing, testing. There's some uh, sweeps here. You can see I created test tones, which I ran through Zeta during our test and run up period. And um, they were fascinating because of the errors they showed up in our system. Top right, there's a, a, a picture there of some audio that's only two frames out. It's a piece of voice audio. And I found that sounded horrible. It took me ages to find out what it was. It was our stereo width enhancer in the station processor. If you turn that off, it stops this audio that is non-coherent sounding grim. I hate stereo width enhancers. The bottom right hand is, a, is my test home sweeps, which I ran through everything relentlessly. And um, one of the things that we discovered uh, in doing so was how bad uh, some digital to digital systems uh, will sound if you don't make sure that they're spec'd properly. 
and you wouldn't know this unless you ran sweep tones. So I hope this works. Uh, on the left is a pure sweep tone. On the right is what came out at the other end. Have a listen. Now that's horrible. And the reason for that was actually very simple. It was a rogue sample rate converter from 41 to 48. So we run everything now at 44.1. What do we do in an emergency? The most likely thing to fail is the broadcasters, uh, the presenters home broadband. So we have flyaway kit uh, in a box, ready to go, dead simple. And the photograph there is the how to connect it up. When that kit arrives, uh, the presenter just plugs it all in. There's a 4G router in there, doesn't have to connect to anything uh, at home. And once it's connected, we remote in, we reset their mic levels to get those right and they're good to go. Um, it's it's really as simple as that. Everything uh, that we do is catalogued. Everything is recorded so that uh, my other engineers, uh, John O, Mark and Peter, if they have to do any triaging of our presenters, they've got access to all the IP addresses, all the mount points. They've even got access because we record every presenter's settings, sound settings on their PC and we record their CPU usage as well so that we can get a comparison and identify if something is wrong really, really quickly. So there we have it, really. Uh, oh, no, there's one more picture I'll show you. This was when we went national. Um, and I, it tickles me pink, this, as an engineer. We went national on SDL, and I did the switching from home, sitting on the sofa using my iPad. Nothing more than that, and my little DAB radio, just to check that everything was coming out all right. It, it tickled me pink as an engineer. It didn't amuse my dog and my cat, but then it was midnight and they were just waiting to be fed. So that's it, really. We have a national station, which is exceeding our expectations, all broadcast and managed from home. It's a fresh, relevant station with a big playlist. That annoys people. We love it. It's all VT'd. And it's VT'd by the most experienced presenters in the UK. They've been doing radio longer than anybody else. It's busted a lot of myths about radio, not least that VTing isn't proper radio. I've got to admit, I was a skeptic to begin with, but I'm now a complete VT convert. And David will explain why. Yeah, I think, uh, you know, I'm a... A convert to what you can do with VT is amazing. We had one chap uh, write to us saying, I've heard that some of your programs are voice tracked, as I understand it's called. Can you let me know which ones? Because I won't enjoy them as much. <laughs> I thought the proof of the pudding there was in the the eating. But I'm going to blog about voice tracking because I think once you master it, you can create something very special. My program is going out live now. Usually I will be dipping in updating links, often during the song that's playing. And uh, actually, I think uh, Quentin's got the slide here of what happened uh, when dear Prince Philip uh, died because, you know, people were saying, how do you cope with that? Well, we did. And we actually got it on air, as you can see here, you know, just within seconds of LBC and before some other national broadcasters. So when things happen, we can respond with speed. But the whole science and psychology of voice tracking is something I think I'm going to write a book on because I just feel I understand it so much better. Uh, if you'd like to ask a question of, of Quentin about any of the technicals, then please do. If you put your hand up now, we'll come to you straight away. We've probably got time for a question or two. But just to say that the um there we are that's how to ask a question raise your hand now and we'll come straight to you back to uh, boom and the proof of the puddings and the eating and if you just see quentin's slide again you'll see that the streaming data you caught sight of it a few seconds ago not nice orange <laughs> can we have this can, can we have the graph back please um is well, it, there we are look at that you, you know there are lots of graphs to be ashamed of this isn't one of them uh this is uh this is the the streaming progress since growth and you can see actually a dip there when prince philip did die because people uh, necessarily do different media things when that happens and uh you know we've made a lot of progress since then and, and as a programmer seeing streaming data live is the most educative thing i've ever seen radar of course came out just a few weeks ago and uh, you know from launch you know, within days getting that sort of figure, 1.8 million listening hours from this radio station we dreamt up in our back gardens and back bedrooms was uh, was quite remarkable. So that's the uh, that's the, the size of it. Now, questions. Let's see if we've got a question on boom. Do you want to just quick sum summarize? Uh, yeah, the, 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 well, the, the summary of the learning, because there's learning. always things to be learned, and I'm old, but I'm still learning, you know, and the things I think we learned out of this 
were attention to detail, lots of fine detail and time spent getting it right really paid dividends. Taking time to know the tech and learning it again, um, testing everything with test tones, that was the most valuable thing for me, was running sweet tones through everything. I highly recommend it. But also reaching out and talking to others. And that really is what TechCon is about. I think it was Nick Piggott who coined the phrase, um, collaborate on technology, compete on content. And thankfully, we've got lots of engineers around the country and technologists who love to collaborate. The fact that we're in rival companies actually doesn't matter. We all learn from each other. Um, lots of lessons from this, uh, but I guess that the main thing is, is just attention to detail. OK, let's uh, cross uh, to our first question. Can we bring in uh, Jamie? I think Jamie's got a, uh, a question for us. Let's just hang on to see whether Jamie comes through. He should do. We should also actually, when we're talking, I keep on hopping between boom mode and, and uh, session <laughs> compare mode, but we should also thank Jamie, uh, uh, the, the other Quentin, Quentin Neal, for his uh, yes, valuable early advice in the early yeah. days of boom. Jamie Laundon, your question, please. Hello. Uh, yes, just a quick one. Uh, do you know um, what is your, your mix of, of DAB to online and how much of your online is smart speaker? We do. Uh, it's about half and half DAB to online, according to Ray Jar. I think that's right, uh, David. Um, and uh, about 70% of our online is smart speakers. Yeah, I think we've been knocked away by the amount of online listening. Yeah. I mean, in terms of listeners, DAB penetrates more, but in terms of listening, uh, we're more heavily online, which for our, you know, people thought, will your generation be able to master this? Well, I think we can just about manage talking to a smart speaker. Don't patronise <laughs> us, please. But thank you very much indeed, uh, Jamie, for that question. I think we've got another question now. And... Let's see if it's the person who I think it is. The, I'm seeing the, the dots of boom, the, those dots of doom when you think what's happening. Uh, Phil, Phil Riley. Uh, Phil Riley is the chief. This is the face Quentin wasn't expected to see. Expected Phil Riley is the chief executive of Boom Radio. So Quentin's thinking, well, why is he asking me a question? Why can't he just phone me? Phil also, it has to be said, used to be the chief executive of Chrysalis Radio. He was the architect of the Heart brand. He was chief executive of Orion Media. He's been in the radio a, a lot of years. He's also also chair of the industry awards, the Arias. Phil, what would you like to say to Quentin? Good morning, Quentin. I, I have a spreadsheet here I need to go through with you, some numbers. No, no, not this morning, Quentin. I do have a couple of final questions for you, though. When you were building Classic FM, what do you think your biggest challenge was? A couple of sentences only, please, Quentin. Sorry, I have to turn myself on. How's that? Uh, yeah, that challenge would... for Classic engineers. Uh, a challenge for Classic FM was uh, building the national transmitter network. Um, it, we'd never built, nobody had built a national transmitter network other than the BBC up to that point. Uh, and uh, building and designing that, I think, was the biggest challenge. And I, I think it was pretty successful. Um, yeah, that was the biggest challenge with, with uh, Classic FM. Second question, again, a couple of sentences. What was the biggest challenge you had in rolling out DAB via Digital One? Uh, convincing people um, that this was the right thing to do. Um, you know, I was a convert. Lots of people weren't. Uh, so that it was hard work. I, I think the, the magic moment uh, was coming up with the idea of doing the DAB chip. I think if we hadn't, if Digital One uh, and uh, Imagination Technologies hadn't decided to invest three million pounds in producing uh, the cheap DAB chip, I suspect DAB would not have happened. I think that was the magic moment. Okay, Quentin, the reason for those questions is just to highlight to younger members of the audience today why you are such a technical legend within the radio industry and why so many people joining us today and who are on the in the audience for this Radio TechCon are in your personal debt. You are a true giant of the industry and the Radio Academy wanted to take the opportunity of Radio TechCon to award a full fellowship of the Academy. Oof. And for the first time in many years, a fellowship awarded outside of the normal confines of the festival. And it's to you. Oh, wow. Quentin, you are the latest Radio Academy fellow. Only wow. the third engineer ever so honored for your services to the industry, stretching back as far as BRMB in the late 70s, through Seven Sounds, GWR, Classic FM, Digital One, BFBS, and culminating, of course, in your current role at Boom. 
your towering achievements, including masterminding the launch of the UK's first national commercial FM station in Classic FM, followed shortly thereafter by the launch of Digital One and the development of DAB under your supervision, stand testament to an outstanding career and an outstanding individual. Yeah. Your inspired selection of birdsong from your own garden to act as the Probably soundtrack yeah. for the pre-launch trial league of Classic FM lives on around the world. It's probably the most famous test transmission in radio history. Now, I suggested getting you a golden soldering iron as a memento. That was vetoed by the Academy <laughs> Trust on cost grounds, who instead have presented you with their cherished fellows to cancer. Luckily, a glamorous assistant, I think, is just off camera there. She might want to come on camera to present you with that decanter. Hi, Annette. There's Annette. <laughs> Quentin, well done. There's a round of applause. Thank so you. many hearts coming up through the screen, heading your way That's through lovely. the ether, both, both from your fellow engineers and your fellow fellows who are delighted to welcome you to their ranks. Well, well done. It, I know you've got a few words to say. Well, You're never sure I, I, of the words to say. I'm not sure I have got much to say. I'm, I'm speechless. I'm completely surprised by this. She kept it a secret. Thank you, Annette. She's been a tower of strength to me in all of this. We met in hospital radio uh, and we've been married 36 years now. So something's working. Um, but she's been a, an inspiration to me and kept me going. But also this industry has just been wonderful to work in. Uh, and uh, I've been very fortunate to be able to play with some very big toys and uh, and and have a lot of fun. Boom Radio, I think, is the 30 second or 33rd radio station that I've either launched or been involved in the launch. Um, and it's as much fun as the very first station I launched, which was Seven Sound. So thank you all. I'm, I'm chuffed to bits I'm, and I'm almost speechless. Uh, thank you so much, Phil. Thank you, Radio Academy. Thank you, TechCon. Uh, thank you, fellow engineers. Keep booming. Thank you, Quentin. Thank you, Phil Riley, for uh, presenting that. Goodness, I'm emotional. Quentin's emotional. And uh, isn't it great, though, to recognise the worth of engineers far too often not mentioned in dispatches when our great industry achieves such great things? Well done to Quentin Howard.